Uh, good evening. It's great to be with you in Long Island City tonight. Um, I'm going to talk to you about cities and why cities need vision and, uh, and why cities are unpredictable and the tension between the vision in cities and the unpredictability of cities for some reason made me think of this picture. Uh, that's me, I'm number 19, and I was about eight years old. And I just want to take you back for a moment to that time in your life and the kind of imagination and the kind of openness that you've brought to your life. And then to help you think about the environment that made that happen. In my case, my family and my friends, my brothers and cousins that you see here. But also the environment that nature provides, that takes care of us, that provides all the things that we need. And the unpredictability that comes with our relationship to nature, particularly here in the 21st century. And for me, this path, this kind of Unpredictability brought me to New York City about 15 years ago. I never thought I was going to move to New York City. I was surprised when I got here. I came to work at the Bronx Zoo, the Wildlife Conservation Society, which was founded over 100 years ago to save wildlife and wild nature from the middle of New York City. Most people in New York know it because of the great experiences that children and families have at places like the Bronx Zoo. My job is to help save wildlife and wild places around the world. And that means working in cities. The future of cities is essential to the future of nature on Earth. And I want to talk to you about that tonight. And the reason I think that's true um, is because when I came to New York, I tried to see the nature in the city. I tried to, to look through the buildings, look through the streets, look through all the concrete, and see this place as a natural place. And one way of doing that was to look back in time when this place was called Manahata. Um, Manahata means the island of many hills. This is a reconstruction of what we think it might have looked like 400 years ago. And we know what it might have looked like because we've been studying it from historical maps. This is a map of Manhattan showing the hills and the streams and the shoreline and the beaches of the city. We use this map to construct websites, which are our modern ways of communicating, which allow you to drill down into any block in the city and see what used to live there what plants were there, what animals were there, and to try and understand how they were connected and how this place worked as a place of nature 400 years ago, but in the geography, in the block-to-block -block geography of the city today. And to do that, we had to describe the network of interactions that existed 400 years ago. Each point in this graph is a different stream type or soil type, an animal or a plant, and this one is human beings. That was the connections of people. And when we live in cities, we know about those connections, right? We know about the complex network that's our friends and our families, our, our associates, the people we meet on the street. But sometimes we forget about that larger umbrella, that larger network that's supporting us, that's allowing us to have imagination, that's allowing us to have vision, that's making us strong and resilient even in unpredictable times. We can put these two visions of the city together, Manahata and Manhattan, and then we can ask, well, where are we going from here? If Manahata represents where this place was 400 years ago in 1609, and Manhattan represents where we are today in 2009, the question is, where will we be in 2409? And how can we get there? How can we support the process of imagination, the unpredictable courses, the, the shocks and the pleasures that are going to come over the next 400 years? Well, one thing we know about when cities come to a place is that they change the ecosystems. So here's a, a view of downtown Manhattan, and here's the same view 400 years later. And now we don't normally think of buildings or streets as ecosystems, but in ecology we're taught that an ecosystem is the non-living environment plus the living environment. And that applies in forests and meadows and streams, and it does in buildings, right? A building like the building we're in today is a non-living environment that's housing us, which are living things. So the ecosystems of cities change over time. The lifestyles of people change when they come to city. These three graphs compare the lifestyle of an average American and an average New Yorker. The average American's on the left side and the average New Yorker's on the right side. And you can see the average New Yorker uses less water, uses electricity, generates less garbage on an annual basis. This comes from our, our way of living, living at density, not needing so much the car, um, not needing so many things, but actually having a life that's external um, and not internal to our, our places of living. 
These are kind of predictable patterns, which are one of the reasons why cities are so important to nature going forward on a planet with so many people. The last thing we can say is that climates are changing. Here's a picture of Hurricane Sandy coming into New York and New Jersey last year. These climate changes are, are in some sense predictable, and they are going to continue to come over the next 100 years. And this is a graph from the New York City Panel on Climate Change that's showing that over the next 100 years, how temperature and precipitation and sea level is going to be rising in New York City. Can we imagine these changes and putting them all together? So some of these are in our hands to change. We have a say about the ecosystems of the city. We have a say about the lifestyles in the city. And the climate is changing both through our action and indirectly through the actions of all of us on the planet. And there are going to be responses. The water cycle of the city is changing. The carbon cycle of the city is changing. The biodiversity of the city is obviously changed. And the patterns of population standing in for all those cultural and economic benefits are also changing over time. And the question is, can we create an environment where we can understand how these changes are changing and to create visions of that change? To actually see what was here before, to see what's here now, and then to contribute our own vision, our own idea. And that's this Manahata 2409 idea, is to create a, a portal, an online forum for everyone, for you in the audience, and for everyone outside to develop and to share their own visions of the future of the environment of New York. The idea is that you'll be able to log on to this website that we're building now and will launch um, later this year. You'll be able to create a vision. You'll be able to give it a name. You'll be able to give it a year. It doesn't have to be 400 years from now. You can make it for next year or 10 years or 30 years from now. You can start with the ecosystems that used to be here or the ecosystems that are here today. You can zoom in and select any part of the city. In this case, I've selected several blocks around the Empire State Building. But you can select any block you want. And then these colored pixels, these, this, um, these cells represent the different ecosystems of the city. The, the pink colors represent different building types. The yellow and orange colors represent different transportation types. This is part of the larger mapping of the city, the transformation of the city, which, of course, we can compare to the ecosystems that were here 400 years ago when it was mostly forests and wetlands. Each color, we have 65 different ecosystem types. And these are tools that you can actually use to paint the city. You can paint single family homes if you want, or office buildings, or uh, stadiums if you like. You can paint natural ecosystems based on what was here 400 years ago. Or you can paint street types, or even things like streetcars and solar panels and green roofs, even urban farms if you like. You can also change the lifestyle of the people who used to live in the city. We have five lifestyles right now to start off, uh, average New Yorker, an average American, um, an average Lenape person, that's the Native Americans who lived here 400 years ago. Something we're calling, uh, in quotes, no impact man or woman, which is, you know, that young vegetarian, bike riding hipster who lives in Queens or Brooklyn, lives in Long Island City perhaps, or an average earthling. We also have climate scenarios, and you can even make it rain in the, in the interface. You can have showers or thunderstorms or hurricanes. And, and the idea here is that each ecosystem and each lifestyle and each climate represents a series of parameters that feed a set of models that allow us to measure the environmental performance of a part of Manhattan. To actually see quantitative measures of storm runoff, of greenhouse gas emissions, of biodiversity, of population, residents and workers, um, even dogs and cats. The idea is to sort of pile up the information in a quantitative way so that you can see how the ecosystems of the city have changed. You can see how the, the floor areas and the land covers have changed over time. You can see the water and the biodiversity and even the carbon emissions and the fuels that are consumed. To try and drill down using modern scientific techniques but to make them available to everybody. To create a platform for each of us to contribute our own vision. To understand where we are and where we've been and where we might want to go. So these tools um, are, you can use to paint the ecosystems. In this case, I painted green roofs across the block where the Empire State Building is and the block across the street. And now this graph is allowing me to compare my vision, which is the red line, with the way that same area performs, which is the brown line, with the way that same area performed 400 years ago, which is the green line. 
And I, I hope you can see that this is asking us questions about what is sustainability? What is resilience? How, how far do we go? And for those of you who are architects or developers, it's challenging you. Can you bring the same kind of creativity that you bought to the height of the buildings and to the latest financial deal to the environmental performance of the city? Can you make a city perform as well as a forest once did? Once you've created your vision, then you'll be able to share it. You'll be able to market public so that everybody else can see it. And in this way, the idea is to make a democratic process, a collaboration toward the future, toward the visions of the future, and to allow the, a diversity of views, but also a synthesis of views. And as the visions accumulate, they become information about what people want from their city. Um, so I'll show you an idea for Tompkins Square Park, just to give you an idea of what you might do. Here's Tompkins Square Park, as it was 400 years ago. I, I don't know if you know, but it was a forest right on the edge of a salt marsh. Um, that's where the shoreline used to be um, in Tompkins Square Park. This is Tompkins Square Park today with paths and those green areas representing lawns. And what if we replaced the lawns with forest and with salt marshes again? Well then, this Manahata 2409 would allow you to actually measure the performance of that. How does that increase the species? How does that change the stormwater runoff? Or in New York City, we've been talking a lot about um, Hudson Yards. Right now, the developers of Hudson Yards get to have a vision for Hudson Yards. But what if we all had a vision? What if we could look at it the way it was 400 years ago? What if we could talk about the way it is today? And what if we could find some mixture that might have more resilience to climate change, but still meet the same population requirements and the same economic requirements of what we want to see out of Hudson Yards? And then again, to be able to compare that in a standardized comparative framework, a framework based on science. But the, the point isn't really the science here. The point is to try and give us a way to talk to each other in the same terms about the environment of the city, to actually see it as a natural place, to see it as an environment. And perhaps, maybe we'll find some idea that the experts don't know about. Maybe there's some idea out there that nobody's thought of for how a city could be better how it could perform better, how it could last for another 400 years. Um, and in this way, we can build up a series of visions over the course of Manhattan, and eventually for the whole city, and perhaps for the whole world. And in that way, create a vision that lasts for a long time, a vision that can be shared by the, the skeptical, and the intrepid, and the creative, that will come to live next in New York City. Thank you very much.